All right, cool. Um, so, uh, hi everybody, I'm Louise. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, tidyverse and reshaping data. And um, main points I want to hear are kind of like the tools that I find the most helpful out of the tidyverse. Um, and then hopefully kind of touch on like how I use them in objects like, um, like RSC objects that we uh, see a lot um, at work. So, um, I've got to make sure to get my zoom where I want it. <laughs> um, okay, so I guess like the first thing is like, what is the tidyverse? So the tidyverse is a collection of eight different R packages that were designed um, uh, for data science and to work with tables, um, and they're all designed to work together. Um, so a lot of the the concepts and the grammar overlaps between the packages, which is really nice because you can just load um, the tidyverse library and then it loads all of these eight packages together. Um, so you don't really have to remember like which function you're using came, came from which package. Um, so kind of the you, people might be familiar with a lot of the packages that are part of the tidyverse. Um, ggplot, of course, is for um, plotting is pretty popular. Um, a tibble is another package and that is like the upgraded version of a data frame. Um, so it's like it never prints more than 10 rows, which is nice because, you know, ever, if you have ever accidentally printed like a 3000 row data frame and you have to wait for it to like run. <laughs> um, so that's nice. And then it also gives you like additional information every time about the, the frame every time you print one, like what the category, of, like what the data type of each row is and like what the overall dimensions are. Um, and then the next package is tidyr, um, and that has to do with data transformations. Um, so like reshaping and grouping, or like reshaping your data tables. Um, and then readr, which imports data into a tidyverse friendly way. I don't find myself using that as much with um, the type of data we work with, but if you have to read like a CSV file in, um, it can be a little cleaner and neater than using like read CS, or I guess read dot CSV, but um, I don't really, I'm not really talking about that today. And then per, um, which is like upgraded loops. So we had a previous R stats club about that. Um, so I'm actually finding myself use a lot of per functions these days, um, but I'm not going to talk about that today. And then um, Blur, which is data manipulations. Um, so this is like you're actively changing data in your data frame. Um, I find myself using functions from this a lot. I'm going to talk about this today. And then stringer and forecats are tools to make working with strings and functions easier. So if you can imagine all of these put together makes um, working with like big data frames really easy. Um, it's a lot of really handy functions that make doing complicated things with data like easier than they are in like base bar. Um, um, so the first thing that I want to talk about is this pipe symbol. So it's the percent forward arrow percent. Um, so it's actually from the Madiger package. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, but it's loaded by any of the fun any of the packages in Tidyverse. Um, so basically it just like strings together your functions. It makes everything a lot more readable. Um, so for here, I have a little example. So like um, if we create just like uh, a little data set. Um, so we just have like 10 random numbers. And then like, say we wanted to find like, pretend that these are error values and we wanted to find like root mean squared error. So it's like to do this kind of in the normal sense, we would nest these functions if we wanted to do them all in one go. Um, but if you use this pipe, you can spread them out. So you can feed data squared into your mean into square root. So this is an equivalent function to this. Um, and I found this fun example on Twitter. Um, that was, uh, um, that kind of explains how this can be beneficial if you have nested functions, especially if you have a additional parameters for each function. So um, for this example <laughs> that I saw, it's like, this would be like to get ready in the morning. Um, so like all of these different parameters have to do with like these different functions, like leave house, get dressed, and it's like, it's hard to tell which of these parameters go with which function. Also, if you wanted to edit this, like 
you know, you're going to miss a parenthesis somewhere, the commas, it gets really messy, whereas like the pipe helps you make this much more human readable, where I can quickly be like, oh, waking up at eight, whereas up here, it's like more confusing. And if I wanted to get rid of this row, I can just comment this out and then the rest of this still works. Whereas that is a much more tricky operation to do in this version of the, the same exact like um, data manipulation. Um, yeah, okay, so then this next example, um, I've paired, okay, so we're using the pipe and I'm gonna use a couple different um, tools out of Dippler. So Diamonds is one of their example um, data sets. And if you've ever uh, read anything about like the tidyverse, they use the Diamond data set all the time. But basically it's just like, it's a really big table. It's like 53,000 rows, each representing one diamond. And then they have a bunch of different um, information about the diamond, carrot, cut, quality, color. Um, so here we can see kind of like some of the benefits of using a tibble um, where they tell you like what the, like what the data type of each column is. So we've got a double um, and a, a double integer. Um, and anyway, so here it's like we can filter to ideal, like cut is ideal. Um, and then another powerful tool in Dippler is this group by function. So that can kind of help you like take one big data table and make it into like, like treat it as different, like a, a group of different data tables. So for example, here, if we wanted to group by cut and then do some other, um, uh, so here I wanna summarize mean price. So I wanna find the mean price for each, uh, for each color. We can do that pretty easily. Um, or is that something that's like going to take a bunch of different steps in base R? We can do that pretty, pretty simply using the Dippler package. Um, you can also, uh, in the summarize tool, um, so it's like we're applying to func a function to each of these groups that we create in color. So we can find the mean of price. Um, this end function just gives you the number of rows that were associated in that group. Uh, but we could also add like max price, And it'll just add a nice column for you. So that's like a really easy way to make like a nice little summary table um, or something like that. Um, also, we can use this arrange function that I put in here. Um, so arrange usually orders things lowest to highest, but I often find that it's actually better to <laughs> order things highest to lowest. So we do that by using a little negative sign in front of that to flip it. Um, so here we have like, okay, so J color is like, their mean price is off is the highest. So it's we can um, make this big table into like more digestible chunks. Um, okay. So the next example I had was um, I'm gonna load some uh, toy data sets that I have in this package that I've been making. Um, but basically I have a little toy RSC object. Um, which is like 2000 genes, 100 subjects uh, or 100 samples. Um, so this is an operation that we use a lot, which is pulling out the call data from this object and then using it as a data frame. And then you know, looking at various things, look, looking at various parts of the phenotype data. Um, um, yeah, so here's the, little toy data set I have. Um, we've got our numbers, we've got brain numbers, uh, the sex of the individual, our diagnosis, case or control, and then we've got some ages. Um, so, uh, so if we were gonna do like, wanted to count up like how many um, samples we had from each group, we might use something like, uh, yeah, like table. So if we wanted to look at like how many samples we had over sex and over diagnosis, you know, we might use table table, um, but it's hard to like add any additional information to this. Whereas we use um, Dippler tools, we can group by sex and age, and then we can say we wanted to know the mean age or sex and diagnosis. 
say we wanted to know like the mean age, we could say um, age. And then we can also get that count information that we wanted. Um, and um, maybe we wanted that. Uh, um, what else uh, could we do? Can we do like, uh, for example, the the first quartile, third quartile, like the, the, the type of information that we have in a box plot for age? Yeah, you definitely can pull that. I'm forgetting what the... There's a quick function for that, or you need to write. Um, is it quartile one? Um, Anyways, yeah. Okay, okay, let's just do min. Um, there's definitely a function for that. Um, I'm not remembering it off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, you can pull that up too. Um, you can also use group by and then oh. line 70 should be capital A. Right. Yeah. But yeah, now we can create a little data frame that has um, this, uh, all these different, like we get the same numbers that we got using the table, but like we can also add more information to this. Um, and like Leo said, if um, like any sort of summarizing function, like will work in here and you can add your own. Um, but yeah, this is really, this is really handy. Um, uh, another thing you can do is like, uh, you can use mutate. Um, so we have our data. So say we wanted to um, add like a age category. So if we wanted to say like, okay, is this um, individual like an adult? Yes, true or false. So the mutate function lets you add a column and then you can either just assign um, like one value to everybody, um, which obviously here is, this is not the case, um, but you can also like put a little function in here or um, like basically use this, any of the other data in the table to create a new column. Um, so here we have uh, age, um, let's say, over and so we get adult true false but now if we wanted to go um oh. uh, one problem with my decombo buddies uh package is that it mounts it masks count from dippler so i need to fix that because i use count a lot but if we wanted to do count adult Um, that's a pretty easy way to do that. And then we can also add other things in here um, and expand these categories. Um, so count is kind of like a shortcut to using um, group and then summarize and then this end function. Count kind of like is the shortcut for that. Um, and yeah, it, I find myself using count all the time. Um, we can also, Let's see. Uh, another thing that's useful to do is like, if you wanted to just isolate like one or two columns from our PD, um, you can uh, use the select tool. So say we just wanted, um, like we wanted to get rid of the age column, you can use the minus, which is nice. Um, or you can just go like our num, uh, where we just wanted our num and age. That's really nice. You can also rename columns within this function. Um, I don't love this syntax. I think sometimes this can get a little confusing because your new name goes in front of the old name. But anyway, that is a very convenient way to rename columns to make different data frames look more like each other or more consistent. Um, and then another thing that you can do is if you have like a big long, um, say like we like this summary, but then we wanted to um, like let's see, filter so you have like a big long group of functions applying to uh, like phenotype data, um, but 
you decide that like you want to like comment out one row or something something that can get annoying with pipe is that if you're going to comment out this last row is that you now have this pipe that leads to nothing which is frustrating because this will error out so that or it'll just give you nothing um so that's annoying so uh way to get rid of that is is you put identity at the bottom then you, this will run so if you're like or or it should <laughs> yeah okay i don't know where i went wrong the first time but anyway now i can comment out um the the last right yeah then you can comment out stuff yeah because this this will pipe into that okay that's Yeah, okay, there we go. Um, but yeah, this is handy if you're trying to like debug something um, in like pipe together functions. Um, so yeah, that can be helpful. All right. So now I'm gonna talk about reshaping. Um, so I find reshaping to be really helpful in prepping data before you use ggplot, because um, a lot of times we work in wider data. So, um, you know, there's lots and lots of columns that have like a similar um, like data type. For example, like we'll have genes and then we'll have samples across these columns and then counts. And like in the tidyverse, we'd consider that wide, de wide data because we have multiple columns with um, like the same variable in them. Um, so kind of there's like a bunch of different ways to reshape data in R. Um, and then the two that I'm kind of the most familiar with, um, it's either reshape two or using the pivot functions in the tidyr package. So to make your data longer, um, you'd use melt from reshape and then in tidyr it's pivot longer. And then to make your data wider or like to bring it back from more rows to more columns, um, you'd use decast from reshape two or um, pivot wider from tidyr. So there's kind of like, basically um, like reshape two has been retired in favor of the tidyr pivot functions. Um, so these are like the most up-to-date ones. Um, there was like an in-between step that was like spread and gather. And I think that people didn't really like those. So now they've moved on to pivot longer and pivot wider, which I think are much more understandable. But I think that there's still, um, couple things about melt that I think are nice. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so pivot melt and decast are from the reshape package. Um, so, so here I'm using this uh, estimated proportions table, which is, um, again, some dummy data that I have in my Econvo Buddies package. Um, so here it's um, estimated proportions from cell type A through E, and then I have 100 different samples. Um, so it's like one big matrix of different proportions. Um, so if we wanted to make it, so the goal is to make it so that each, there's a row for each sample cell type, and then we know the proportion. So we want three columns, two rows, or we want three columns. Um, so using melt, first thing we're going to do is use this row names to columns, because right now these are row names. Um, so this row names to column function, uh, will make this into a column of data. And then the- You have a lady in the terminal instead of the console. Yeah, I saw. <laughs> um, so- but, And is row names to column from reshape two or from the plier? It's from, it's from, it's from Dippler. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, this is helpful if you, um, uh, need to move your data over. Um, and then, okay, so then melt, it takes, basically we have to tell it like what the ID of each data is. And for us, it's a sample, like each sample is gonna have an observation of each of these other columns. So um, that's what that argument is. So if we use melt, then it looks like this. So we get samples a column and then it, takes that and it's a variable 
So cell A is our variable because it was one of the columns. And then value was um, the, the proportion that was in there. Um, so one thing that uh, is not great about melt is like, then you have to have like additional, you, if you were gonna go forward and rename these, variable and value are not very useful column names. Um, so you have to do another step where you rename them. Um, and then if you had more columns that you wanted to um, like preserve as ID, you have to give this a list. Um, so pivot longer is a little slicker in that you, re um, you can rename, you tell it what you want the names to be. So it has a, uh, a variable that's names too. So you tell, okay, I want my names to go to cell types. So your column names are now in a column called cell types and you want your val values too, and you want those in a, a column name prop or for proportion. So, so that's, it's a little, it's a little nicer. And um, I think it's a little, you can do tricky things like um, tell it like every name like with cell is gonna be um, pivoted and stuff. We won't go on to all of that, but that's a nice function. Um, yeah, so now we have the status, but at the end of the day, these are both gonna give you pretty much equivalent uh, data frames. Which one do you prefer to use nowadays? Um, okay, so I think pivot longer, I basically use any time I have like a data frame or um, it's, I think it's way more user-friendly, um, but mill is nice because you can use it on a matrix. Like if you just have like a matrix, you don't have to like name anything and it is like a little more convenient there. So that's like when I find myself using melt. Um, but most of the time pivot, pivot longer. I'm now in the pivot longer camp. Um, yeah. So for, uh, for an example of like how you use this data, I think it's just Geom box plot. So it it wrestles like this is a much more easy um, data frame to graph in ggplot now. Um, okay, but say we wanted to graph proportion of cell A versus cell B, then like the wider version was actually what we want. So if this was our starting point, but we wanted to go to that wider um data frame uh we'd want to make our data a lot wider um so the decast uh, function is a little more complicated than the the melt function and that you have to give it like a formula to decast so you have to tell it like um like that the cell type like the cell type is like what you want to observe so if you use decast then we get back to our wide data frame this can get tricky if you have more, like you had more columns that you wanted to keep rather than sample. Um, so decast can be a little tricky to use. And I always have to, I always find myself like having to use the help function or like Googling decast examples. Um, whereas I think the pivot wider is again, much more user-friendly here. Um, so we're saying, okay, our ID is sample. Our names are from the cell type column. Our values are from the proportion column. And that makes a lot more sense to me. Um, yeah. So now we've got that nice wide function or we got the data back to our wide version. Okay, another thing I like about um, like, I think- One, one question think, here is, um, yeah. So let's say, I mean, here cell underscore type, right? You're typing it as like as an object really, right? So it's using uh, what's called um, non-standard evaluation in R, right? Um, why do you have a vector of variables? How do you specify? Like if you have a variable that- Oh, if that, we had uh, like, if it like was a, just cell type or- no, Like, yeah, can you have like, um, multiple like ID columns or something like that, right? How would yeah, you I, I see that? what you're saying. Um, 
my experience using like tidyverse is that like some functions work better than that with others so like um so like if you're using it in like a function and we wanted to go um wider from like something else so let's just call it like call and um yeah my experience with this is that like some functions are like easier to work with stuff like this than others um it's what bang bang i forget if you have to load a package for that but yeah so you have to use like the bang bang um notation to so it treats cell type like with that non-standard evaluation so it's looking at the contents of call instead of just call because this will oh that worked okay maybe pivot wider is really smart and <laughs> um looked at that or you know it might actually be happening it might be able to use the other variables to figure out what that last one was So let's see if that'll break. Okay, yeah. So I think it's working there. Yeah, okay. So it seems like it's um pretty friendly to using that. Um so that's cool. Cause um some which one I feel like rename always gives me grief if I'm like trying to give it like trying to give it a variable as what as a column name but um yeah I don't, I don't have a great answer but here it works <laughs> um does anybody have any more questions about reshaping stuff I realize that I've just been blazing ahead here All right. It's good to know that this one works um, with uh, regular evaluation because then you can take that code and make it into a little function later, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so the next example I wanted to do was joins. Um, so something that can get tricky if, like, if you're combining multiple. Um, if you're combining multiple tables together, but they don't all contain like every row, uh, that can get a little tricky if you're using like base R because then you have to like, fil there's like a filtering step first. So something that I've become um, pretty dependent upon is like the Dippler left join, left join, like right join. Basically there's a whole little family of join functions, um, but like the one that people use the most often is left join. Um, so let's say we had our, PD data frame, and we wanted, let's call this PD prop. So we want to combine our phenotype data with our um, estimated proportions that we have up here. So let's see, but let's say we only want to do it for our female subjects for some reason. Um, so we could do filter. Okay, so the first step would be we just want to filter this data. Oh, yep. Okay, so now we have our filtered data set. Um, uh, so now we want to join our estimated prop. Our estimated proportions to this. Um, right now, this estimated proportions object um, doesn't have uh, that column. Um, okay, wait, let me back up. Um, so we want to join by our numbers. Um, right now, estimated proportion does not have a column that is our numbers. So we can use that pipe inside of this function to uh, to make estimate proportion have a to use that call name or row names to column and give um, create that column in estimated proportions all 
just run that. We can check that out. Cool. Um, so now if we run all of that, it's we get a message joining by our number. So you can either give left join um, the, this argument, basically like that as an argument, or it will automatically check to see what column names you have matching between the two data frames and then join by those automatically, which is nice if you don't want to type. Um, but you can also be more specific um, if, if you're doing a trickier join. Um, yeah, so anyway, now we have this proportions merged onto this data frame. And then, um, so that's nice. And then if you wanted to like go back and put that on like a filtered summarized experiment, you know, you can plug it back into that. Um, but this is an easy way to join stuff and um, not have to worry about your rows not matching up nicely because this does it automatically for you. What happens by default, if, let's say the, the estimated proportions doesn't include information for every sample. Does it like leave it as NAs or does yeah. it like just drop them? It gives you NAs. If you wanted to mm -hmm. do like an exclusive join, um, you'd have to use inner join. Um, so that way, like anything that was missing in your, I guess, um, should have maybe had a diagram to explain this, but basically it treats your two tables as a left-hand table and a right-hand table. So in left join, it matches all of your data to all of your data in your left table, which is this input. In a right join, it matches all your data to that table. So if we did a right join here, we'd get NAs for a bunch of Be in here somewhere. Okay, yeah. So um, we did a right join. We had all the samples in our estimated proportions table, but only like half the samples because we just had our female samples in the phenotype data. So for all the male samples down here, we're missing all of this data. That's a right join. And then if we were going to do an inner join, um, basically it does it only matches, it only gives you rows that has all of the data. If you're going to do a full join, it expands both tables so that all of your rows match. Um, so yeah, th those can be useful if you want to like um, see what data is in what table, what matches up, what doesn't. Um, but left and right join, I think, are the most useful for combining data because usually one of those is like the set you want to go with. So for example, uh, for us, if we're working with um, X and X injunction data from two different studies where like um, they're not overlapping, necessarily fully overlapping, right? Um, yeah. We could do a full join then. Uh, yeah, that, that would work perfectly there. Mm -hmm. Not sure how fast it is at that scale, but uh, yeah, the, the full join would be what we were looking for there. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any questions about joins? Cool. Um, yeah, I think I wanted to. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to do a reshape example now with this um, more complicated object. Uh, before you go on. Yeah. Um, I do know that. It's the matching different column names in this join is actually a weird syntax for R. You might want to go over that real quick. Oh, because yes. Good call. Yeah. OK. Um, so earlier, I think we renamed our column na row names to sample. Um, so say that we rename this to sample here. If we wanted to tell, OK, so then if we got rid of this, and if we run this, it it uh, we get an error. X and Y have no common variables because none of the column names match. But like, if you know that sample and R number are the same and are what you want to match up, you can tell it. Um, and it's like, pretty sure this is it. Oh. You gotta oh. use a 
what is it by left and by right or something yeah but you have to use a list a c list that that would work if it was python but you have to use the, the c the, the when they make the vector i don't, I don't remember what it's called but the oh. c yeah and it is oh yeah left, but then that yeah left is that left, is left yeah right. yeah good call that's that is a tricky one and then yeah this is also useful if you don't um, it, you can skip a step of like making your tables standard um, and just kind of use this trick. Um, cool. Yeah, okay. So anyway, now we've got this nice, more complicated table. Um, so now if we wanted to do um, give it longer, um, uh, we can say, I have to check out the, the help here. Okay, yeah, so here's like um, one of those like useful things. Uh, so you can use the function starts with. So here, like all of our columns that we wanna make longer start with cell underscore. So I think this should work. Yeah, here we go. So basically um, we keep all of this phenotype data that we wanted for each sample and but now we have our proportions in the longer format so um but for but we see here that like our samples are r071 we have it repeated five times for cell a through b so all of this data is the same female control age are all the same but we have the different we have our different cell types and we have our different proportions down here Then we can use names to cell type. Oh. Okay. We could call this the prop long. Um, okay, so let's say that we wanted to now check out um, like our cell type proportion versus age just on like a simple scatter plot. Um, probably shouldn't see anything because this is random data, but if there is something more interesting on this, um, this might be kind of confusing. Um, so then I find especially long data can be really helpful if you want to use like the facet wrap or um, facet grid functions from ggplot um, because technically like if we just wanted to look at cell type A, we could have just um, used PD prop and then prop plotted like cell A. Like we would have gotten the same plot here, but to then plot all the other cell types, like we'd have to repeat this for each cell. So that's like an advantage of having your long data because each of your observations of cell proportion 
are in one column. So then we can then use the other descriptive columns to um, transform that or like tell ggplot to color it something different or use fast grid or something. Um, so let's change that back to how it was. Yeah, okay, so now we can do all of them. But say you really wanted each cell type to be in its own. Um, its own plot. We tell cell type to facet, or we tell facet wrap to create a plot for each group of cell types. It's kind of doing the same thing that like group by does. And now we get a plot for each of our different cell types. And that's really, that's nice. Um, yeah, so I found that that can be a really useful way to get your different groups of data organized nicely. Um, and then I guess one last trick I have, kind of like that identity trick at the end of a pipe. Um, if you're using ggplot and you have a bunch of different things added onto your ggplot, sometimes like um, you'd want to like edit out one thing, but you run into the same issue that you'd have with the pipe where if I comment out this last one, we've got this floating plus sign here. So if I add null to the end of it, it works anyway. So you can comment out random things in your GG, um, your ggplot commands. So that's nice. Um, yeah. So that's kind of all I had planned. Um, does anybody have any questions about um, the stuff or? Look, it looks pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, I guess, what are your, the limitations you know related to performance? Like um, how big can a table be type of thing? I haven't like, um, I think like the, the one thing that I ran into recently is I was using the group by function um, to group a table I was creating where it was like, cell types times each gene times all the other cell types. So it was getting pretty big. And um, we maxed out the group by libraries or something. I'm still not totally sure what that error was, but that was that is something that I've run into um, uh, with, with the group by. I did break that once. Um, but most of the time, this stuff is pretty stable. Um, so works pretty well. Um. And my like very big knowledge is that uh, you can maybe use like these uh, filter by functions, et cetera, um, on like objects that are not loaded in memory. So that's maybe related to KJ's um, message. For example, like maybe some package defines something equivalent to Tibble, but it's actually like only on disk. And it does the operations like, um, like on subsets of the data. Oh, oh I, um, like, I don't know, no, like for example, that would be like the equivalent of delayed array on for bioconductor. I don't know yeah. there's something like that. Yeah, I don't know if I'm super familiar with that, but that sounds neat. Um, just catching up with chat because uh, Zoom likes to hide the chat from you when you're sharing your screen, um, but yeah. Yeah, that'd be, um, Need to look into more. So, are are these the uh, most of the functions you use from the tidyverse? Yeah, I would say that these are the ones that I definitely like reach to on a day to day basis. Um, every now and then, I'm like, I find myself like needing like I'm like I need to do something and it's probably obscure, and then I like Google it and like Dippler has like a very easy function. Um, I know like. One thing I was doing, it was like um, kind of in the same same case. It's like um, I needed to find like I had a bunch of groups and I needed to get like the top. Uh, it, it's what working with um, the mean ratio stuff. I was like, OK, I want the top five mean ratios for my 3000 groups I have, uh, you know, for each 3000 for each group out of my 3000 groups. And like um, there's a split function that's really easy. So then you just like 
you arrange your data and you split it and then it just gives you like, you can just grab the top row. So I found that like a lot of the grammar is really useful. And then like there's functions, I use mutate all the time, um, filter all the time, select and rename all the time. Um, but then like every now and then you need to do something weird and there's like a function that makes it easy. So I find that to be very useful. So where do you immediately go look for help whenever you need help? Um, go to I the mean, help file CNR or you go to Twitter or the community just, or the website? I do just Google things a lot. Um, and then they usually pop up and then sometimes, you know, you get, you figure out what the vocabulary for whatever you were trying to search for. And then, um, but I, some, I do sometimes just like lead my Google searches with like Dippler do this and then it gives me something, but uh, I could probably evolve my searching a little bit. I mean, that's good enough to know, right? Like how you, how you do some of your Google searches, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I struggle with that sometimes too, right? Like finding the right keyword. Like if you knew the keyword, you yeah. could find help really fast, right? But yeah, exactly. Right can be tricky. Oh. Yeah, this was very exciting. I don't know if anyone else has more questions for Luis. I think we all need to practice it though. Yeah, it did take a bunch of practice. Um, one thing I wanted to mention at the very beginning and I forgot to, is that um, I learned all this stuff primarily. Like I took a course in my undergrad and like basically the course was we went through the R for data science book um, with Parrot. Um, and this is basically like, all tidyverse stuff um so it was kind of like my entryway to r um so like if anybody's like really interested in this this is a very good book to to check out and it, it's free online so easy peasy and it, this is on the tidyverse link that i put on the google doc so it's very easy to find cool. there's a version in spanish too if anyone needs it. Yeah. 